10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome, Maria. Glad to have you. Welcome. Hello. Just popping in to see what you're talking about, guys. This master, the smartest guys in town is in this uh, hackathon. <laughs> I, want to, I want to be yeah. here too. Yeah, ten's ten is ten can definitely. Uh, he's definitely one of the smarter guys I know, especially in this space. Huh. Tell me more what you do and why you here. I just got here. I think I'm late a little bit. If you are talking okay. about it. Oh, we we're just waiting to really get late. started. So yeah, we're not late because um, we're still waiting for a few people to join. But um, I'm going to be talking about um, some tips and tricks in Malo, and especially like the kind of thing that I've noticed that comes up all the time whenever you're making any kind of Malo smart smart contract. So um, it's all stuff that that I would have already done in my videos. Like, but at the same time, in my videos, the emphasis was more on how do we get this uh, contract done? And then it's like, well, okay, we're just going to do this. We're going to do recursion here. Um, so I, what I want to do is just take a step back with a few of these things and like really um, give it a little bit of time to like go, well, this is, this is the core technique we're using and this is where it comes up over and over again. So there's going to be kind of a extremely simple smart contract at the end of it, um, but really it's um, it's looking at the kind of at kind of common themes that you will probably end up using um, if you're writing Milo smart contracts. Nice. Well, why why don't we actually just uh, kick it yeah, off? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's start. Cool. Uh, so I'll... And just to let people kind of know. Um, Tin has been delivering a lot of the Aiden Makerspaces lessons that you see on YouTube today. And, uh, you know, our learning to journey in this has been going on for a while now. And so he's really been, uh, you know, since kind of the forefront of the last summit and that hackathon that uh, Liquid won, you know, Tin was an early developer on Liquid and has really been in the ecosystem for a while, um, you know, testing and trying different things. So he's got a lot. Of, I think I'm excited to learn from your insights today myself. Cool. Thank you for the intro. Um, yeah, I'll start. I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Looks good. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk is Milo Tips and Tricks. And yeah, um, again, about me, we've just said this, but yeah, my name is Tim Pavlinich. I'm Trigger NZ on GitHub. Um, and I'm a functional programmer. I've been a functional programmer for over 10 years. So I dabble in Haskell, Scala, all kinds of functional programming language languages and I'm an Ada Makerspace coach. Um, so within the space of Ada Makerspace, I've, I've been presenting, I guess, like Marlowe and Haskell videos with a, with a focus on making it as approachable as possible. So, um, you know, I think you should be able to use Haskell and Marlowe, um, without necessarily being a professional Haskell programmer. Um, so that's that's been my focus and that's going to be continue to be the focus of this talk. Nice. So, so yeah, I want to cover some ideas that come up again and again in Malo programming. So because they come up again and again, we've kind of done them before, but I my feedback has always been a little bit like, uh, you know, I think there are a few people who still struggle with it. So I just want to kind of recover those specific issues rather than just glossing over them like we do in the other videos. So um, specifically my titles, well, I guess my, my four items that I wanna cover are thinking about recursion. So when we build up these recursive smart contracts, um, 
what I'm the kind of thinking that I'm doing to to kind of build them up because um, there's a kind of standard template that I go through in my head before building up these contract functions and I, I guess I want to try and share that um, two is uh, it's kind of awkwardly called tokens and slots it's really it's really um, to deal with some error messages that we are bound to hit when building these um, contracts and we specifically when trying to pass a number for a slot or pass a string for a token name or a role name. Um, so this will talk about what, what the error message you'll see is and what the workaround will be. Nice. Um, uh, a little bit of information about validation on how we can actually validate some actions that our smart contract participants do um, rather than just blindly accepting them. And finally, counting. How can we keep track of things? So that's the agenda. I like it. Cool. So let's start talking about recursion. Um, so in Haskell, we use recursion to loop. So whenever we need to repeat something, we end up using recursion because that's the that's really the looping mechanisms of Haskell. And that's kind of a little bit different from other programming languages, which also support kind of standard looping constructs as well as recursion. Um, and Haskell, all looping is basically done exclusively through recursion or something else built on top of recursion, but nevertheless, you're using recursion under the, under the hood. So we want to repeat something. And the main reason that this comes up in Milo programming is because we want contracts to be kind of variably large. So an example that we've touched over and over again has been crowdfunding. And the thing is that for a crowdfunding contract, you don't know how many participants there are. So you could have three people donating or you could have 10,000. Um, and really using this recursive, and, and the key about Milo is that Milo contracts are finite. So you can you kind of make them for a finite number of um, participants, but then you've got this, you know, potentially variable size, but then you end up with a finite contract. So the, so what we end up trying to do is, well, we write code to generate us a contract of any size, and then we execute it at a particular size. So, um, and in previous videos, we've kind of talked about, I guess, nuances of that. For example, how could we have, you know, any number up to n, like any number up to 50 participants, but just um, the focus really here is on recursion. So we're just going to say, well, how do we write a contract with 50 participants and then, you know, scale the same contract to 100 or, and I guess specifically we start with zero and we scale to any number we want. Gotcha. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about. So let's look at these contracts. Like when you start up the Blockly thing in Milo, um, if we look at all of the contract types that we have. So we have a when, and this has some conditions. And then we have a continue slot in there. So the thing that goes into a continue is another contract. So we've got a contract containing another contract. Gotcha. And then if you look at pay, it's kind of the same thing. We've got some details. So there's a payment that happens and then it's followed up by another contract again that fits into the slot here. So it's again, a contract within a contract. Same thing for if. This time we've got two potential contracts within one contract. So we've got some observation and then in here, we get another contract and in here we get another contract well same thing again let it has some value and then another contract all these pieces have uh, another continuation until you hit yeah, it in exactly yeah and i like that you use the word continuation because that's actually a very accurate term um but yeah all of them uh, contracts that kind of have what I would call a subcontract, right? So you've got a, 
like you've got a smaller contract in here and then the total of that smaller contract plus this is a slightly bigger contract. So we've got assert and this is the exception, right? A close. So the only contract that doesn't have another contract within it is a close. And yeah, they all are nested. And in a way you can think of them as all recursive because there's this base and this base is a close. And the close, the base is the only thing that doesn't have another, uh, another subcontract within it. No continuation. Uh, yeah, or, or continuation. Maybe that's, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, so, so close is the base case and the other contracts or uh, the, the recursive cases. So when you do something with one of these contracts, generally you do a special handler for close, like this is the close case. And then for everything else, you break it up and you construct the continuation first, and then you inject that continuation into a slightly bigger contract, which is one of these, um, one of these contract um, variants, I guess. So what I wanted to show here was that if you've seen basic Haskell recursive functions, they kind of work the same way. So if we've got this simple make list function, which takes an integer and gives you a list of integers. So if that integer is zero, then it gives you an empty list. And if it's something else, any kind of n, then we make the list for one smaller n and then we jam n onto the end of it. So that like makes a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to n. But if we kind of look at this, what I'd call classic demo example of recursion in Haskell, there's a little bit of similarity to it to these to these contracts that we've seen before, which is that we've again got this base case that we that is kind of our core thing that we are doing something with. And then we extend that base case um, by doing the continuation first and then, then putting it as a part of a bigger structure or a bigger contract. Gotcha. So the structure is the same and that's really important because that's no co coincidence. So to build a recursive contract, there are always three questions that we're gonna to wanna to go through. Like what's the base case? This will go to the, uh, I'm missing a word here, but what I meant to say was this will go to the closed contract. So whatever your base case for your kind of high level idea that you're trying to do, like your, for example, um, crowdfunding number of participants that'll go to a base case con uh, and you could have you could have more than one base case in a contract so you could have a base case for success and a base case for for failure correct uh yeah yeah i guess um implicitly um yeah of course you can you can have i mean whether within a recur within a single recursion um you you tend to have one one out recursion but okay. but um but those side cases like um like the error handling especially um you you'll probably have another recursive function that that has its own base case and then it has its own recursive case that builds up the error handler if you've got a complex error handler gotcha um yeah in this one here we're not particularly talking about error handling, we're just kind of going down the happy path. But yeah, the key thing is um, base is close, right? So in the crowdfunding example, what's the base? It means zero participants, that's the base. And that's when we just close the case. And then how do we build up the contract for one participant? Well, we do, we handle whatever one participant does and then we hand it off to the, to the case for zero participants, which is close. How do we do it too? Well, again, we do whatever one person does and then we hand it off to the subcase for one and then that hands it off to subcase for zero, which is closed. So we end up with the whole thing. So yeah, 
what's my base case? What's my subcontract or continuation, if you like? And how do I combine those two things into a bigger contract? So we might have something like this. So this is a contract which just has N people depositing, for example, five people depositing. So how does it work? Well, um, when we have zero, so this in, this takes an integer and returns your contract. So that integer represents how many people are involved in the contract. So zero, if we've got zero people, then we just close, that's the base case. And then this other recursive case is, well, we're gonna have N, right? And we're gonna do whatever for one, one instance. And then we're gonna, call that same recursion to create the subcontract for n minus one. So in this case, when the user deposits one um, on slot, I guess 100, that, that was just a quick little trick to make my slots go forwards. So I just did 100 minus n. It's not, there is a better way of doing it and we'll do that later on in this, in this um, presentation, but just for now. Just so the slots go up, I've done this 100 minus n trick. But anyway, um, the key thing is that we have a we have this n contract, and we do a single deposit, and then we continue with the contract for n minus one. So if it's if we got say three, that means we do a single contract, a single deposit, which continues for two, which does a single deposit which continues for one, which does a single deposit, which continues for zero, which is a close. So that means a total is a total of three, which is what we wanted. Um, so yeah, we can see this working um, here. So that's just the same as what I had on the, is that too small? It's pretty small. Okay, I'll make it bigger. That looks good, thank you. Much better. Um, so yeah. Just like I said, um, we can deposit one, deposit one again, deposit one again, deposit one again, deposit one again, and then we're done. Um, I think my example had, yeah, my example had five participants. So only five slots to be an investor. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you know, in these simple ones, it's actually no worries, we can make it 20. Um, yeah. But that's the benefit of recursion right there is what you're showing is yeah, that you, can, you can repeat that contract one time or 2000 times or. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just gonna. Yeah. And we're done. I, I didn't really count, but I think, yeah, cool. The total was 20. So yeah. Okay. So that's that's the kind of thinking I go through to. Uh, can you can you see that in Blockly real quick? Too? Is there a way to? to... Uh, yes, there is a way. It's a little bit awkward, but um, let's do it. Yeah, just because uh, you can put the two because we started with the puzzle pieces. Yeah, cool. So you used to be able to happily switch between Blockly and Marlow and Haskell, but now you gotta. Kind of. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. It used, like you said, it used to be right there in the navigation. I think there was some. Um, so we'll go new project Marlow. And then we can. Sorry, copy this one. And then we can view it as blocks. And so that's what it looks like. I just zoom out a little bit. You can see though how the, that same contract is just over and over and over and over. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can see how quite big, you know, we learned how huge these get, you know, when you get a thousand investors or. Yeah, they get, they get huge, but especially in these simple cases, it's actually quite manageable. Um, one thing that we've mentioned a few times is that um, when each of these is a branch, 
then they get really big and you're kind of a little bit limited by what you can do. Um, but so far, so good. These these particular ones are not branches. They're just straight straight lines. So there's only one subcase for each one. So it kind of grows linearly, which is nice, meaning you could do a thousand and it's just gonna make one of these trees of depth a thousand. It, you know, yeah. it's big, but it's not that big. Um, yeah, so what I really wanted to emphasize here was these, these um, three thoughts that have to go into it. What's my base case? What's my subcontract? And how do I combine the subcontract into this bigger contract that I'm doing? And what happens in the example is exactly that. The base case is zero. The subcontract is just this contract with n minus one. So it's just a contract that's one smaller. And then how do I combine it into the bigger contract? Well, in this case, I just add a deposit and then I have the subcontract as the con continuation. So that's the, that's the game, that's the recursion game. And I just, um, whenever you get a bit flustered or a bit like, confused i guess like what do i do now just keep coming back to these base questions on how to build recursive functions and that'll help you cool. nice so that's the that's the first point i wanted to make now i want to talk about strings and integers and tokens and slots so previously we were talking about this slot and using recursion now i want to talk about this slot here, specifically these strings that we can put in there. And also these slots here. Sorry, when I say slots, I mean like places where you can enter things. I guess it's a bad term because slot also has a meaning in the blockchain. Gotcha. But yeah, these values here and these values here. So here's a real simple um, contract that we might want to write. So we might want to write contract that takes an integer, which is our slot number and a name, which is like the depositor name. And then we do our, when the depositor deposits, um, we just close because we're trying to make simple contracts to illustrate points. So we just wait for a single deposit and then close the contract. And we wait until slot that's passed in, right? So we get an integer. And so if we, if we pass in five into this function, then this we would expect this to wait until slot five. So that looks good to me. It seems like it would plausibly work, except it doesn't. So if we try to compile, we get these terrifying errors. And I'm sure, Boone, you remember we've seen these before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um and yeah that's one thing that i've kind of glossed over in the past and now i want to go over in a little bit more detail because um you will have to fix these yourself right like um these aren't rare enough you know they're not special cases they come up all the time gotcha so there are two errors here well three three but like you know two two of them are the same error so we got could not match type char list with Plutus token name. So yeah, we expected token name actually got a string. So that's the first one. And the second one's the same. And then the third one we have is could not match expected type timeout with actual type integer. So this is saying, yeah, I expected a slot number, but I got an integer. So yeah, this is just the same thing that I just shown, just a terrifying looking error message but it's actually not that bad. There are just a couple of things you have to do. So two errors we're dealing with, and these seem to be the most common ones. Um, but I hope that if any others come up, one of these two techniques will help you as well. So first of all, token names. Um, if we look into this, uh, Sorry, um, this initial contract that we made here, right? 
when we put in a string role, that worked, no compile error. But when we pass in a string, like in this case, where it's a, where it's not a hard-coded string in here, but something is passed, it doesn't work. And it's a perplexing problem, right? Because usually when you're doing any kind of programming, there shouldn't be a difference between, between whether you're passing something or whether you're just hard coding it in. It's the same value, the same type, but yeah, here it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So what's going on here? What's going on is there's a Haskell function called from string. And that takes a string and it gives you like your, the thing that you're trying to get, like for example, a token name, right? But it's actually more general than that. So it may be a token name, it may be a text. It, it kind of depends like, what it what it exactly it gives you is it depends on the type that you're trying to reach receive so token name knows how to convert itself from string but a string is still not a token name you have to do this conversion gotcha meaning the answer is instead of passing in name here you should pass in from string and that's its own operation, so it has to go in brackets. I'll just remove this. And that, that, um, that from string function lives in a module called data.string. So you've got to import that as well. And now that'll compile, well, We've still got the slot error, but this uh, from string, this role thing is now fixed. So, so the question is still, why did we not need from string here? Why, why were we able to put up a straight string, like a literal string and it just worked? Mm -hmm. And here we needed it. Well, it turns out Haskell has, the ability to, when it sees a uh, literal, like a string literal, it automatically goes and checks the type of that's required here, in this case, a token name, and goes, okay, I see a string literal, but I need a token name. So that doesn't match up directly, but then it, when you see it, when it sees a string literal, it also checks whether there's a from string for that. So it kind of, when you use a literal, it automatically inserts, it automatically inserts this from string for you without you having to put it in. Whereas when you're passing the, the value and you're not just using a literal, you're just saying, no, this is definitely a string, then you have to call the function. So basically, if it's a passed string, you have to call from string explicitly. Whereas if you use a string literal, Haskell is smart about it. Gotcha. Um, so that's so what really going kind on. of depends on how you're calling it. Yeah, it depends how you're calling it. Um, so yeah, if you get any kind of these, I'll just bring it back um, to this so we can see the error again. Um, expected some kind of token name or uh, you know there's token name there's a whole bunch of others um i think token name is the one that we mostly come up with but the actual type of string try just using from string and see if that fixes your error yeah that's, that's, that's just a little addition there and because we did run into that quite a few times yeah and i think in the past i just quickly fixed it and we kept moving you know rather than um, explaining the issue so yeah that's um so that's one way of doing it right um you can you can get a slot by get a token name by um doing from string now there's another one here we've got a similar issue and 
again it says could not i'll just let's just actually see it in in the bigger screen so could not yeah again it says could not match expected type timeout with the actual type integer um so in this case specifically for slots i've said so yeah to get a token name you do a from string to get a slot there's just this function or it's actually called a constructor if you like which takes an integer so you can say slot with a capital s to convert an integer to a slot um we're on the second tab there so instead of passing this integer slot we can just say slot slot like that nice yeah. no more all cleaned up yeah so that's those two compilers cleaned up and yeah i wanted to show you that because because it really does come up all the time and it's it's one of those things where you know milo is haskell but it's really supposed to only be showing you like the easy parts of haskell it's not supposed to be too hard but i think sometimes some of these type errors um bring a little bit more required knowledge with it so i guess that's that's why i wanted to address that um yeah so that's the fixed code that's just what we showed um a few minutes ago so and i've put a link um to this milo semantics haskell file because that's where i look up these definitions um but it'll probably only interest you if you like that in it, that itself that semantics it can be written and you know is written in just full haskell so like um if you've dabbled in haskell a little bit feel free to have a look but um if you've owned if you're it, a plutus pioneer it's a must uh must check out i would say yeah yeah so that's that's actually your definition of um all of the Marlow types and how to use them. Yeah, nice. cool. So that's the second point. Okay, now this one, we're gonna be able to stay in the block world. Um, so validation, how do we validate things? Like specifically, how do we validate deposits? Um, how do we allow ver variable deposits and validate that to match our rules basically? So in Milo, in Milo, the simple way of doing a deposit is you just put a, up a deposit block, but that has two problems. One is you've got to tell it how much is being deposited, which is an awkward thing because the user hasn't told you how much they're going to deposit yet. And two, you've got to check if the amount being deposited actually meets your rules. Like, is it too much? Is it enough? Those kind of things. So what's the answer? Instead of just doing a straight deposit, we give the user a choice of the amount, then we validate the choice, and then we deposit the chosen amount. So instead of having one deposit steps, we have three steps. So that will be in my, just move the zoom window here. Um, that will be here. So this is an example. I'll just zoom out yet a little bit. So yeah, instead of just doing a straight deposit, like in the middle here, um, we do a choice. So for example, um, we might have a choice, call it deposit amount by the current participant. In this case, it's just me, but it can be general when it can you can pass in the current participant the balance for that choice are some balance so that's your first validation just the fact that like you've entered some balance meaning they can't go outside it they have to choose but, within that specific amount to how much they yeah. want to contribute yeah and that may be enough um if it's just a simple thing like if that's the only thing then that's fine 
Um, I've still shown you how to how to go about actually validating it. So you have an if, right? So you have a choice and then you have an if. And this if is if the deposit amount is greater than or equal to a constant, for example. So I'm saying here it has to be greater than 500. Now, this is a toy example, right? So we could have achieved this just by putting a 500 in here as well. But I'm, I'm illustrating the how you go about validating something. So, so this is how basically. So you have an if there with some condition. And notice that the condition is um, they've chosen something called deposit amount. And now we can use that deposit amount as a value um, under choice. Gotcha. So we can say the choice is greater than or equal to 500 in this case. And then if that's true, then we do a normal deposit and we carry on with something. Um, so I guess I should. Um, Person get your token or NFT or something like that would happen. Yeah, yeah. Or recurse and follow up with the next user, you know. And more people with the deposit. Yeah, you just do whatever the rest of the contract does. In this case, we'll just uh, we'll just close. So the if observation is the validation method. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's how you that's how you observe things. So you if basically gives you a gives you a, um, a condition. And this condition is like this value. So if value one is greater than or equal to value two, and there's other, there's other kind of observations, you know, you got whether the party made a choice, whether, and then they're mostly comparisons, but you can have and and or, so you can have, I don't know, if the deposit amount is greater than 500 or they already have 500 in their account or something like that, right? So you can kind of use these combinators and and or as well to make more complex conditions. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. The I can see how is, you would use it for like uh, um, including more than one native asset. Yeah. If you were yeah. checking to make sure like they had to include ADA, but they also had to include this other native asset. Yeah, exactly. So that would be an if observation and then you would have an and, and then you'd do something with the end. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then we just follow up with the actual deposit. So let's let's simulate this. So ah, uh, sorry. Uh, one thing I do have to do is these slots should be one and then two. So if we deposit, or if we choose 100, then there's nothing to be done because it's not greater than 500. Or if we choose 700, then you it go- Let's you on, move on to the deposit. The deposit aspect. Yeah. So that was just a small little point, but what I was really trying to illustrate is the fact that you can validate these inputs by letting the user make a choice first, and then, then you actually do the deposit. Because by the time they've deposited, if you want to check something later, it's kind of too late. That okay. makes sense. Again, this is something we've done before. I just wanted to spell out this is the core idea of what we're doing. And we've seen that example. Um, and the final thing that I want to talk about is counting. Um, sometimes we need to keep track of something. Um, for example, the total amount deposited. And for that, we use let, which um, if you remember in our last video, we covered. But um, again, I wanted to spell it out here. Um, so so for example, we might have something like this. Um, we do a let at the beginning, and we say the total is equal to a constant of zero. So we start with a co uh, total of zero. And then a deposit of one happens. And then we, we can say, well, now the total is, we do another let to kind of update that total within that sub branch. 
And now the total is whatever the previous value of total was plus one. So that's kind of how we count things. And then we can do something to follow up there. I don't know, pay someone party. And you would be using the uh, the lets for counting in uh, what aspect would this be like a, a primary use case you see happening? Um, like oh, this is this is just the counting, but like you can actually use lets for any kind accumulating any kind of value. So specifically, what I'm thinking about is keeping track of that. Like as you've got multiple depositors into a pool, like keeping track of the total amount. Okay, so and now I'm tracking. So uh, you can use the let then to say, say you're creating a pro like a jackpot lottery pool. It yeah. would allow you to let people keep putting in until a certain point, and then the jackpot lottery would top yeah. off, and, and it would be the random drawing would happen or something. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect example. So you keep track of the total, and then when when the total is greater than some amount, then you do the lottery, for gotcha. example. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so for example, yeah, here, uh, I'll just make this like 10 instead of 2, um, because just to keep track, just to prove that we're not just counting, we can add anything to it. So when the deposit, when the user deposits 10, we add 10 to the total and then we pay the total amount. Um, of ADA to from roll to roll two, for example, and then we close. So simulate that. So roll deposits 10 units of ADA and the contract paid it to roll two. But the key thing here is that you notice that we didn't say here, we didn't say pay 10. We said yeah. use the total. So that's a reference to this updated value that's happened here. So that's that's the other point. That's how you count things. And again, this is something that's going to come up all the time. So the final thing I wanted to show is like something a little bit more complicated where we put all four of those concepts together. So this is it. Um, I'll go through it step by step. So first of all, I've written a small function called role, role name, which just basically takes a number um, and converts it to a depositor name. So if the number is five, then the, uh, then the result is going to be depositor five. So it goes from an integer to a string, all right? And then there's this contract part, which takes an integer, that's the total number of depositors and returns your contract. And it does a, it starts off with a let, which just starts off by setting the constant, the total to zero. This is that total let that we were talking about just now. And then it does a call to a recursive contract, which takes two integers. One is the current um, the current number, like zero, one, two, three, four, five. And this one is the total number that we have. Um, you'll see shortly why why I used the, the two of them. Um, but basically, yeah, let's have a look. It's got a recursive uh, it's got a base case like usual. So if there are if we are in participant number zero, no matter how many total ones there are, then we just close the contract. And then if for the other case, well, we do we do the step for one participant and then we recurse. So let's find the recursion. The recursion is here, right? So we start off with total and n. 
and then we recurse into total n minus one and it's going to go n minus two and minus three and minus four until it's zero gotcha so that's the recursive part that we've used um second um of this uh role name function you notice it returns us a string so we have to do a from string to convert it back to a role name and what i've done here is total minus n so like because remember when we're actually recursing um n goes like five four three two one but we want zero one two three four five like we want it in the other order so that's what i use total for i just kind of subtract n from the total so when an n is five then it's going to go five minus five which is a zero and then when an n is four then it's going to go five minus four which is a one so it just kind of turns it around count makes it count up instead of down which is what we want here so yeah that from string role name total minus n that's how we get the depositor number and I've got this role. The, that from string was how we solved our the token name error we were getting. That's the major thing for me to remember. Yes, yes. Um, and I've got a, that repeated a few times, um, as you can see. And then also slot. This is the other thing. So we have, a again, I do a total minus n. I add 10 to the end of it just to kind of give everybody a little bit of space for like, of, of a few slots so the first participant has 10 slot has to finish by slot 10 second participants has to finish by slot 11 and so on like that's the latest they can use so yeah that's how and again to go from that integer there to a slot we just put in a slot constructor so that gets us that rids us of the second error now probably easier to see the rest in the simulator actually in in blockly so we'll we'll take it to the simulator and then we'll start a new project oh i could have just done yeah actually i'll do it here so this was our US box. So it's quite big, but mm -hmm. we don't have to go in all of the depth. The key thing we want to see here is I've done that choice. You zoom in just a little bit, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, better. Yeah. So we've done a choice by depositor zero. Um, and then we update the total to be the current total plus that choice. And then we say, well, if observation is less than 500, then we go on and we have deposit a zero deposit. And then here's a recursive step, which goes into one, same thing, choice, this time by depositor one, um, followed by an if, which is the validation, followed by the deposit um so you see we've got all the components here we've got the recursion we've got the we don't have the compile errors meaning we fix them uh we've got the validation with an if um and doing a choice first and we've got the let of the total which keeps accumulating yeah and then so, the let rem reminds me now that is also for that we were uh that crowdfunding use case for mm -hmm updating the available balance yeah. yeah yeah we did the exactly the same technique there yeah gotcha. yeah now now i remember that a lot better cool cool yeah so like my goal in this presentation was really to focus on the core techniques rather than focusing on the bigger contract um because i think it's good to approach this thing from both directions um so appreciate it, it was Great presentation. Cool. And I think that's all we have. Um, yeah. Any questions? Well, um, let me just have a look. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Oh, who have we got? 
Sam, are you there? I know you just kind of come in in the end, so I'm not sure if you have many questions because you. Yeah, we lost our other person. Sorry. Yeah, I, okay. I just I just saw the message and saw that it dropped by. No worries. No, that's that's okay. No worries. The uh, recording will be up, so if you are interested in uh, checking out the topics, uh, probably tomorrow I'll have this recording up and on the YouTube uh, Ada Makerspace YouTube. Cool. But I uh, appreciate that since we don't have, you know, any other uh, questions and stuff. In I know that you are in the process of a move, so uh, time, okay. is, time is of the essence. And yeah, well, I got up early for it, so I've got a little bit of time. But yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope that was informative. Yeah, it was great. I, you know, and uh, it's been, you know, a great learning adventure with you in the, you know, whole Cardano, Marlowe, Plutus. Um, yeah all of the above yeah yeah um, now yeah. Ah, cool so well yeah I'm, yeah i was kind of i kind of um you know like i was a little bit stressed over doing this in front of a big audience and having to answer kind of questions left and right but there was no one here in the end so i guess like that's a yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Also a disappointment yeah yeah no i no, i'm stressed out about it yeah, yeah, cool. Well, uh, again, appreciate your time very much. And I'm sure that uh, many people will appreciate watching this later on. So uh, cool. if there's, you know, any way that you do, uh, if people have questions about where was the your GitHub again, that they can maybe follow oh. or reach out. Um, I don't know if they can reach out. Um, What's a good way if someone has a question to... Twitter, Twitter, same same um handle will you put it just in the chat real quick and then I'll, yeah. we'll make sure it's the right one yeah sure awesome. so if anyone has any questions about that stuff yeah sure cool beans brother cool all well, right thank you very much uh, have a good one and um yeah we'll see you next time sounds good thank you cool. bye, bye.